Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thought I'd start off with just a, a little bit of a, an introduction to myself. I'm um, assuming technical surveillance countermeasures is um, relatively new to probably 50 or 60 percent of the audience today. Um, my background is military, 14 years military, and I've done 14 years hard labor in them. Um, the corporate technical surveillance countermeasures um, arena, really. Um, sure, Technical have asked me to come today to talk about um, technical surveillance countermeasures. Um, and the agenda really is to understand the corporate threat from te um, technical surveillance, um, to overview technical surveillance countermeasures, um, and to use the 2012 Olympics as a case study, really. Um, why the 2012 Olympics as a case study? Well, that was the first time that um, UK government ever put um, what is a counterintelligence rule out to tender to um, the corporate world to provide that kind of service. Um, the tender itself, obviously a long process, um, and very interesting from an operator's perspective, because it, it gave us the first view of what government perceived to be threat within the technical surveillance arena that was um, or should be mitigated at a government level. And that gave me a unique standpoint to be able to assess that at a corporate level as well. Okay. So, a um, bit tongue-in-cheek slide pictures, really. I don't, I've never watched this programme. But the first thing we have to look at is, is, is common perception and what people commonly perceive the threat from technical surveillance to be. Um, that's the first starting point for any audit, and it's the also the first starting point for any problem, as far as I'm concerned. Because the common perception around technical surveillance and how to defeat technical surveillance is, of, is often learned through Hollywood. It's what people see in movies, it's what people see in the television, and it's what they read on the internet. The actual full grounding of threat, vulnerability, um, and mitigation of the risk that's created therein is usually a completely separate um, story, really. Okay. People also perceive um, the threat to be purely commercial. Commercial devices, um, the kind of quick plant, what we would call the quick plant devices. Um, this is the kind of uh, thing that you can see that you can buy on eBay. Um, a mixture of... Um, the kind of mouse with the GSM engine inside that allows people to dial in and listen to conversations. Um, wired microphone sets that you can buy down at Maplin for a tenner. Um, the double plug socket, which you can buy again on eBay for 50, 60 pounds. Um, I'm not saying that these devices shouldn't be worried about. The Ecuadorian embassy um, found a big problem with the double plug socket uh, and also a bit of a problem finding it for a while. Um, Things like um, phone chargers. Uh, the last gentleman was talking about bring your own devices. With your own devices come your own accessories. With your own accessories come your own risks. Um, for example, this small thing, I think it's, a, again, £60 off eBay. Um, that phone charger has a GSM engine inside, can be dialed into anywhere around the world um, and allow the attacker to listen into conversations. Um, the usual thing, uh, what people might think of as a, a bug, um, the thing in the centre at the bottom and the thing on the left, all readily available, all very commercially available devices. Anybody with small motive, a small budget can afford these, but they are very effective attacks, extremely effective attacks. Um, just because of the last bring your own device uh, uh, talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, the phone charger, the phone charger attack. Again, about 60 pounds off eBay. It's a sealed unit. Um, there's a SIM card already inside. It's a roaming SIM card, so whoever buys it doesn't need to put a SIM card in. And it's fully sealed. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and any other phone charger that was in your area, be it a secure area or an insecure area. Um, for me to guarantee to find that, I would need uh, ooh, 
probably a minimum of £70,000 to guarantee, to find that, and a maximum of about £100,000. Okay, so don't write off the commercial threat. Okay, obviously, it's obviously a picture of me uh, when I've had to shave and remove my glasses. Um, the reality of threat in the commercial world is very different. The reality of threat that I see every day, every week of my working life um, is that technical surveillance attacks veer towards government-level attacks and they veer towards government-level technology. Most of the people that I speak to on a, on a business front daily perceive that they either don't have a threat from technical surveillance or that their technical surveillance um, threat is what we saw before. Um, disgruntled employees, people leaving, um, and um, putting in something that was found on eBay. That's just not we f what we find. We don't find that at all. Um, we find that, especially in a competitive market type attack, well, let's say if you've got, um, if, if, if it deals worth a million pound, deals worth a million pound, is it worth a 10% investment to gain the intelligence to win that deal. You can get an awful lot of spying for that amount of money, an awful lot of spying. You can hire ex-government employees with all of the trade craft and skills that they need to attack your company. You can hire a team of them, and they will have the kind of technology that a normal corporate sweep team just cannot find. And that's been proven a number of times. There was an instance not so long ago um, and I think it was, a, it was a divorce case, but there was shares involved in that kind of thing. And um, there were some pa pictures in the paper of um, a few guys attacking a house. Those guys were ex-military and ex-police technical surveillance officers. If you looked at the equipment that they used, um, that was police equipment and military equipment that um, left their work and arena when they did. So the reality of threat is often far greater. Okay. Now that we've looked at the kind of um, the very, very basics of, of threat and vulnerability, uh, we'll just have a look at technical surveillance countermeasures as itself as a service. So um, I think this is the kind of DOD um, definition of um, TSCM. And what it doesn't take into consideration is um, communication security and IT security. Now, I'm not going to step up my depth and start talking about IT security. That's not my realm. However, I think when we, um, when we look at the next slide, we see how they fit together. And this is the biggest vulnerability that, that I perceive um, in the corporate world, which is visioned from what I've seen at the kind of government world. Um, you have your physical security and your physical security budget. You have your IT security and your IT security budget. And you put them together and there's always a gap. There are devices which are manufactured specifically for that gap. Devices which will not be found by standard physical security. Devices which cannot be found by standard IT and cyber defense. Um, I'll give an example, and it is a brief example. Um, we have a thing back in the workshop which is called a passive sniffer. And it's a small box, about this big. It has four ports. Two ports with double communication, two ports with one-way communication. That can sit quite happily on a wired network and sniff the packets from that network. If we attach a 3G um, device onto there, 3G technical surveillance device, we can open a direct 3G tunnel to sniff packets from that network. The cost of that is 50 pounds. The ability to put that in, anybody could put it in. Okay, so the reality is that TSCM, while it might seem a little bit James Bond, it might seem a little bit never happened to us, um, there is a gap, and there's a gap in most people's security strategies. Okay. Um, this slide covers the type of corporate TSCM services that there are, um, or what people may sell their services as. Um, people sell... Um, sweeps, surveys. Sweeps and surveys, very um, reactive usually. Oh, we think we might have a problem. Oh, we've got a board meeting coming up. We need to secure this area. That's not something um, that people treat their IT security like or their physical security like. 
You know, if, um, if you were to think about building security, what security managers don't do is say, it's looking a bit rough this weekend, we might get some locks on the door, or look at their IT security and think, well, we might have a firewall on Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah? So we need to look at it as a holistic part of information assurance. Um, corporate espionage threat briefs. Again, previously when I talked about um, uh, people's perceptions, people's perception of threat um, in the technical surveillance world, buyers of a service aren't in the correct position to quality assure what they require and quality assure the service that they're buying in unless they understand the threat and the vulnerability. Therefore, the first stage of any um, assurance in technical surveillance countermeasures is to understand um, the threat and uh, a corporate espionage, espionage threat brief really is the way to start that process. Training, again. Um, I know a lot of companies, and there's probably a lot here, who have their own in-house teams. We need to look at how those teams are managed. Are they doing it every day? Yeah. What kind of training have they received? Is the training that's required as an ongoing process? And what quality assurance should we be laying across that training to ensure that we mitigate the threats? Not just the threats from yesterday and today, but the emerging threats. And secured meetings. Um, how many people um, in the room, I won't ask for a show of hands, how many people in the room um, have meetings outside of their secure areas? How many people remove sensitive information willingly from that secure environment out to a nice location like a hotel or something like that um, and then carry on the process of storing, creating or communicating that valuable information. A bit like today, if I look at today, um, I'm wearing a radio mic. That radio mic is analogue, therefore anybody from outside of here um, can quite happily receive that on something they bought from Maplin, eBay, something like that. Even the small bits of information like that can be useful. All intelligence has a value. So, process again around securing meetings. Yep. Making sure that meetings and external areas where communication happens is covered. What range of equipment is available and what's required to do um, a, a survey? I, I can tell you now, if anybody that talked to me for half an hour one-to-one, -one, they'd realise that what you see in the movies just isn't true. We have, as a team, invested initially £250,000 in equipment to survey for all known threats. Threat changes day by day, week by week, year by year. And we have to reinvest another £75,000 a year to keep up with that threat. The equipment that we purchase can't be purchased on eBay or Maplin or anything like that. A lot of it is controlled equipment. Okay, and we'll match that off with the Olympic case study. When you look at this, you'll see that what all we've done now is transfer what we learned from the government side of life um, into the commercial world. Uh, and it's proven very successful. We have around 14 fines a year. That's 14 fines a year in organisations just like yours. Okay, so we used um, eight operators. That's eight fully trained ex-military personnel, security cleared, um, trained and um, experienced over 150 years' worth of experience in our full organisation in technical surveillance countermeasures. It was a two-year project, a two-year project of sweeping and then returning to sweep areas month after month with um, the £250,000 worth of hardware, and it's a lot to carry. Um, this is the kind of cycle that we had to go through. Sweeping, technical surveillance countermeasures, isn't about turning up and saying, this area is clear, yeah? It's far more than that. Again, it's not about putting a lock on the door just when you need it. So reconnaissance, um, it's necessary to work out time analysis. How long is it going to take? What am I going to need? Who do I need? Do I need any special kind of um, people to do um, the systems that are there? Threat assessment and vulnerability assessment. This should be done for every single area, for every single case, under, otherwise we don't understand the threat. We can't calculate the vulnerability and risk, therefore we can't mitigate against that risk. And the planning phase. Operational phases. In the Olympics, we used phase one and phase two strategy, whereby phase one was the empty building, so um, the empty royal box, the empty secure rooms, before anybody moved into them. In that case, we can look for deep plant devices, devices which have been built into the fabric of the building. 
Phase two, when people start to work there, covers all other kind of threat vectors. And recovery. The most important phase, I think, reporting, okay? Mitigation of any vulnerabilities or threats which we've identified, maintenance, and then planning for the next round. So if we had 12, 14 secure areas to look after, each one of those steps is followed through to the planning stage where we plan for the second phase of that sweep. Okay, thanks very much um, for listening. Um, if you've got any questions now, I'll be glad to take them down there.